Welcome to the first of this term's Refugee Studies Centre public seminar series around the theme of refugee histories in the Global South. I'm Dr. Anne Edfan. I am a departmental lecturer in forced migration here at the Refugee Studies Centre, and I am really pleased to be convening the seminar series this term. We are kicking off with a brilliant guest lecturer, Laura Nadekoro, who will be speaking to us tonight on the topic of refugee denial, settler colonialism, and the making of the Global North imaginary. Laura is Associate Professor of History at Carleton University in Canada, and her research explores various facets of the history of refugees and humanitarianism, especially regarding questions that relate to settler colonialism, human rights, and race, her book, Elusive Refuge, Chinese Migrants in the Cold War, was published with Harvard University Press in 2016. And as of recently, she is, along with me and Dr. Ben White, co-convener of the new Institute for Historical Research seminar series on doing refugee history. Dr. Madakoro is going to speak for about 30 minutes this evening, and then we will have another 30 minutes or so for questions and discussion with everyone. So please do write your questions in the box, which you, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your Zoom screens while Laura is speaking, and that way we can get as many of them in as possible. But for now, I will hand over to you. Laura, you have the floor. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm very grateful to Anne for the lovely introduction, uh, the promotion of the IHR series, and of course the invitation to participate in this series. Uh, like many people, um, my work has been severely disrupted by the pandemic, and I have spent much of the past uh, few months with my children, whom I love dearly, but who at the age of four and six are not at all interested in big questions around refugee history and forced migration. So it's a real pleasure to be here today, and thank you for, so much for the invitation to participate and for being here. Um, I want to begin by explaining that I am speaking to you today from uh, my home in Ottawa, Canada, which is located on the traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation. And I am privileged to live and work here. Um, when Anne first approached me about presenting today, I confess that my initial reaction was one of hesitation because I, I didn't think I had anything to say about um, refugee history and the Global South. My, my work um, for the past decade or so has been largely focused on questions of exclusion, particularly among white settler societies, so thinking of the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Uh, but as I thought about it further, one of the things that started to nag at me was precisely how the divide between North and South came to be beyond the sort of quantitative measures around GDP and so on. Um, and so what I'd like to do today is offer somewhat of a conceptual take on the history of the Global North and the Global South um, as ideas and to think through the making of a Global North imaginary through two frames citizenship and settler colonialism. And before I forget, I will start to share my screen with you. Uh, there we go. All right. Um, so I would I, I'm going to focus on two frames. I'm thinking through citizenship and settler colonialism. And essentially what I would like to suggest is that part of the work involved in making a global North imaginary involves a denial by countries in the global North of their own histories and possible futures as refugee creating societies. This, and I'm calling this quote, refugee denial operates on multiple levels and it's very pervasive. It's not just at the level of the state, but I argue that it's at the level of, of non-state actors as well, of citizens and settlers. And so what it ultimately does is reinforce the idea that certain, certain kinds of societies create refugees while others do not. And this denial is built on a complicated dance between notions of citizenship and settler colonial practices, and it reinforces the divide between North and South. So what I would like to do today is offer a couple of historical examples um, that have led me to think along these lines. Just by way of context, Sorry, I'm now having problems advancing my screen. There we go. Just to give you a sense of where some of my thinking around this has emerged. I think part of it um, started with the 2015 Syrian refugee crisis and the siege in Aleppo. And in particular, when activists started to 
point to histories of European refugees in Syria and Turkey and, e and Egypt as a way of encouraging um, citizens in Europe and countries in Europe to provide some kind of assistance to Syrian refugees. At the time, I was fascinated by the way that history was being used to advocate for intervention. And I was also interested in the forceful reminder of the history and possibilities of refugeehood in the European context. My thinking around this issue has become um, more focused, largely as I've started to think around the issue of environmental refugees. Um, and I was very struck um, in, as I started to look at this question a couple of years ago in the context of Canada and the United States, how discussions of climate refugees often fixate on the issue of refugees coming from abroad, even though climate change is a global phenomena. And so there are obvious reasons why, you know, discussions of environmental refugees focus on, South, on the South Pacific instead of Miami, for instance. But conceptually, it was really striking that the discussion that I was seeing was all about environmental refugees coming from elsewhere. The, the idea of environmental refugees within the United States or Canada didn't seem to have the same resonance. And so it is this, this, this implicit assumption that refugees come from elsewhere that I would argue is critical to the making of a global and North imaginary and one that continues to persist in our current moment, where countries such as the United States and Canada appear as beacons for refugees rather than refugee creating societies. And while this has been absolutely true numerically over the past several decades, with a vast number of refugees and internally displaced populations located in the global south, this conceptual divide is not accidental. It's, it's the divide that takes work. Um, it is a deliberate mentality born of citizenship and settler colonial practices that make it difficult to imagine global North nations as refugee creating societies. And it is one that lends itself to an arrogance about the possibility of, refu of refugeehood and the seeming immunity of liberal democratic societies or countries in the global North from ever being the source of refugees and forced displacement. And what I wanna emphasize here is that this conceptual idea of the global North is, is very much divorced from both the lived reality in our current moment, but also the historical record. Refugee denial operates in real and conceptual terms as evidenced by the 2002 Safe Third Country Agreement between Canada and the United States, which treats each country as safe and prohibits with some exceptions, people from making refugee claims in one country if they have made a claim in another. Events in recent years obviously belie this sensibility. One has only to think of the Trump administration's 26 uh, 2016 decision to revoke special status for Haitian refugees in the United States to see that people felt unsafe and began to leave their homes in America for, uh, and make their way elsewhere, including to Mexico and Canada. Ongoing violence against Black Americans has also prompted refugee claims in countries such as Canada. In 2015, American Kyle Little Canty made headlines after submitting a claim to the Immigration and Refugee Board on the basis that he was Black and therefore had a fear of persecution. In the wake of the shooting death of Michael Brown and the death of Eric Garner in New York, he said, and I quote, I'm in fear of my life because I'm Black. This is a well-founded fear. The board ultimately refused Canty's claim on the grounds that he had not been personally targeted. targeted and it ruled, and I quote, his removal to the United States of America would not subject him personally to a risk to his life or to a risk of cruel and unusual treatment or punishment. And obviously that decision reverberates uh, in different ways in our current moment. So America today does not think of itself as a refugee creating society, nor does Canada, though the histories of these two places are rife with examples of refugee movements and forced displacement, including that of Indigenous peoples who were displaced as a result of war and conflict and European settlement, Acadian refugees who were expelled by the British from Nova Scotia and surrounds beginning in 1755, um, here you have an illustration of some of the United Empire Loyalists who left the United States in the wake of the American Revolution. And early American leg legislation, such as the 1798 Canadian Refugee Act, provided land to Canadian refugees who supported America's bid for independence. And this is something that um, Evan Taparada has written about extensively. And it was a really rich way of thinking about these early um, discussions of refugee movements in the context of the United States and Canada. 
More recently, forced displacement in the Arctic and across North America as a result of modernization projects, including the constructions of, construction of dams and associated flooding, has also forced indigenous, indigenous peoples away from traditional homelands. And yet, the national imaginaries in, the, in Canada and the United States position these two countries largely as places that welcome refugees, places where refugees go. Being a refuge for the persecuted and displaced is one of the ways that countries such as Canada and the United States and the global north distinguish themselves conceptually from countries in the global south. And this obviously has a tremendous impact on how the character and capacities of countries in both the global north and global south are perceived. Critically, this denial is not accidental. It is deliberate and it results partly from the language that citizens of these countries have used in times of crisis to insist on their own citizenship and the expected guarantees of that status. By way of example, I'd like to briefly illustrate two cases where the, ten where the tension between citizenship and refugeehood was drawn in stark relief and which I think contribute in subtle and implicit ways to the making of this Global North imaginary. The first involves Japanese Canadians who were interned during the Second World War, many of whom later faced deportation, and the second involves African-American residents of New Orleans who were disproportionately affected by the poor infrastructure and the devastation wrought by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. In both cases, claims to citizenship reinforce certain notions about what Canada and the United States represented, ideas that have ultimately influenced the politics of refuge in the present. In the present. And I would say the politics of refugee denial more explicitly. All right, so let me turn to my first example. This is an image taken by a Japanese Canadian photographer, Tak Toyata, of uh, Japanese Canadians being displaced in the Second World War. As brief context, following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 7th, 1941, the United States and Canada moved to intern Japanese nationals and Japanese Americans and Canadians. Beginning in 1942, almost 22,000 Japanese Canadians were removed from their homes on the west coast of British Columbia. 75% of those involved were naturalized or Canadian born citizens. Some citizens privately understood their situation as a kind of displacement or exile. Journalist Muriel Kitagawa, for instance, described the situation of Japanese Canadians as that of, and I quote, Israelites on the move. And she also referenced the idea that Japanese Canadians were going to be housed in cages um, and kept in un unsafe conditions. However, most people involved never discussed their situation publicly using any kind of language about being a refugee or being an exile. Instead, what they talked about was being treated as second class citizens. Um, and what they insisted upon was that their forced removal violated the promise of citizenship in Canada. And so in the early, early years of the internment period, it was the language of citizens citizenship that was used as a defense against the um, forced internment uh, initiated by the federal government. This changed somewhat at the end of the war when the federal government proposed to deport over 10,000 people to Japan based on a questionnaire which had been issued in the internment camps in February 1945 and which asked people if they would be willing to be repatriated east of British Columbia or back to Japan. By August, just before the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 6,884 Japanese Canadians over the age of 16 had registered to be transported, along with over 3,500 dependents. And this amounted to 43% of the total Japanese Canadian population in Canada. Although many attempted to revoke their decision after Japan formally um, declared defeat, the government uh, in Canada passed three orders in council in December 1945 to proceed with the deportation. And what the orders, um, what the deportation orders did was trigger a response amongst civil society activists, including the Cooperative Committee on Japanese Canadians, which was a Toronto-based umbrella group, which organized a protest against the deportation orders. They pursued legal action against the federal government. They undertook educational campaigns to promote public awareness about what was unfolding in the recesses of the federal government strategy rooms and in the Canadian courts. 
The CCJC organized letter writing campaigns to the Prime Minister and his cabinet, and they, they attempted to encourage solidarity on behalf of Japanese Canadians who were facing deportation. And central to the CCJC's educational campaigns were two brochures that treated the deportation issue as a question of refugeehood and exile. And I've just put up on the screen here an example of one of the brochures, and you can see where it would have drawn uh, my attention as I stumbled upon it in the archives. The language of from citizens to refugees is incredibly evocative. This, um, this brochure was issued in 1945, shortly after news of the planned deportations became public. And what I found immediately striking as I looked at this brochure was a, was a stark divide that was being drawn between citizenship and refugeehood. And I really think it's important to emphasize here that this is a divide that citizen activists were using to make a case of, against deportation of Japanese Canadians. Um, here, the language of refugeehood was designed to spark outrage and repulse the idea of deporting citizens. And given that this publication was created at the end of the Second World War, when there was a great deal of preoccupation about displaced people in Europe and Asia, it also reveals, I think, some discomfort that people had about the idea of refugees themselves. And so when we think about the making of a national imaginary and the idea of a global north and a global south, we actually need to pay close attention to the language of citizenship and refugeehood and how they have operated not only in tension with one another, but also in relation to one another. And again, I think it's really important to consider that this, this particular brochure was produced by citizens and not, not state actors. By way of further example, I'd like to turn to events in the United States in August 2005 and consider a very similar tension between citizenship and refugee refu refugeehood discourses. And I realize I'm jumping across decades, um, and I don't at all mean to imply that the, the two cases that I'm about to discuss are, are, are absolutely the same, because I do believe in, in change over time, but I think there's some interesting resonance between what happened in Canada at the end of the Second World War and the discussion that took place in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. So just by way of, of a, a reminder, on August 23rd, Hurricane Katrina, which was a Category 5, category five storm, made landfall in Florida and Louisiana. It was one of the deadliest storms in American history. An estimated 2,000 people were killed, 1 million more were displaced, and property damage was estimated at well over a billion dollars. In the city of New Orleans alone, there were approximately 700 fatalities as a result of breaches in the levee system that led to severe flooding. When the waters rushed in, people scrambled for safety and security, and it was hard to find. As numerous contemporary observers noted, authorities were ill-prepared to deal with the magnitude of the crisis because the urgency did not stem from the natural disaster alone. It was a product of decades of neglect. In the words of anthropologist Adeline Mascadier, who wrote about the experiences of African-Americans who were disproportionately affected by the storm and its after effects, the waters, quote, literally destroyed the barriers that had kept them out of sight. So in the wake of the devastation, news cycles featured images of residents clinging to their worldly possessions in the floodwaters or making their way to the Superdome, which became a major relief center. And this coverage invoked images of mass displacement globally. Alongside the images, journalists began to casually refer to the residents of New Orleans. And you can see some sense of the discourse here uh, with this um, screenshot from the New York Times article. This language raised uh, the ire and the concern of New Orleans African-American residents whose sense of their status as citizens of the United States was being rhetorically raised, along with any claims to material relief from authorities. Um, and what, again, it's akin to what we saw um, in Canada at the end of the Second World War, in order to claim citizen citizenship, people involved started to reject the idea of, of a refugee discourse. As the slide um, suggests, there was a dramatic correct um, rejection of the idea of refugeehood in order to remind the public, policymakers and politicians of the citizen citizenship status and the attendant rights of those involved. So just to give you um, a sense of a couple of the, the more sort of extreme sides of this debate, a quote here from Reverend Al Sharpton and the response from President George Bush, and both of them engaging with this question of refugeehood and citizenship. 
So in the case of uh, Hurricane Katrina, we see a dramatic rejection of the idea of refugeehood in order to remind the public, policymakers and politicians, of the importance of citizenship and what citizenship was meant to entail. Um, again, this is true of what happened in Canada at the end of the Second World War, where one of the strategies against deportation and exile was to pursue legal uh, claims, but also a rhetorical strategy that claimed citizenship. And I recognize that there's deep irony in these two cases because here it's the experiences of a persecuted racialized minority that gives weight to the meaning and value of citizenship, but also rejects any affinity with the notion of refugeehood in the process. So we see examples here, historical examples of a refugee denial in order to claim to citizenship, citizenship status. And as I've argued elsewhere, citizenship is often rendered most meaningful by those who have been denied the full promise of, of citizenship in liberal democratic societies. So as we look to the conceptual divide between the global north and the global south, we can't forget the hard work that has gone into claiming a particular form of citizen, citizenship that is itself fundamentally exclusionary. But this is not the only form of refugee denial that has manifest itself among countries that now claim membership in the global north. And so in the time that I have left, I would like to turn to the relationship between refugeehood and settler colonialism in the United States and Canada, which obviously is implicitly connected um, with questions of citizenship as well. Settler colonialism rests on the initial and ongoing dispossession and displacement of Indigenous peoples. And so if we're going to talk about a global North imaginary or refugee denial, we need to think deeply about where the history of settler colonialism sits in these practices, for they at the core at the, of the histories of the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. For one thing, we can look to a long history of displacement as a result of war and conflict between Indigenous peoples and later European colonizers and settlers to see how notions of kinship and adoption practices shaped relations between communities. And historians Elizabeth Ellis and Amy Villarreal have written, have written brilliantly about this. Their work serves as a reminder that the practice of refuge predates the notion, the, the notion of the nation state, for one, and that it has also trans, been transformed as a result of the drawing and reinforcement of territorial state borders. But we can also look to how questions of sovereignty, territory, and Indigenous resistance also complicate notions of refuge and security, and ideas of the United States and Canada as normative sites of refuge. This issue has emerged in the United States in the context of the border wall with Mexico, which traverses the traditional territory of the Tohono O'odham Nation. It has also emerged in terms of questions about sovereignty and responsibility captured by the no ban on stolen land movement, again in response to Trump's 2016 efforts to exclude people from largely Muslim countries. This recent resistance points to a core and unreconciled difference in how Indigenous peoples, settler citizens, and governments in the global north see themselves, their responsibilities, and their relationship to refugeehood. And here I want to highlight how the very language of refugeehood is problematic in terms of questions of territory and settler colonialism, as scholars Michelle Hogue and Brendan Rensick have shown in their work on borderlands in particular. Rensick, for instance, in his work Native But Foreign, Indigenous Immigrants and Refugees in the North American Borderlands, has demonstrated how Indigenous peoples continue to move across emerging, emerging borders, such as the US-Canada uh, border, which was largely finalized in 1846, but that in doing so, their movements took on new meanings as they came to be viewed as refugees or illegal immigrants, rather than people moving across traditional territories. There are well-documented instances of mobility across the Canada-US border in the 19th century in which state authorities referred to Indigenous peoples as being refugees or being in exile, while those involved saw their movements as being across traditional homelands. This includes Louis Riel, the Métis leader who spent time in, quote, exile in Montana, Sitting Bull and the Hunk Papa and, the, and Lakota Sioux who left the United States after the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce and his followers who tried to join them there. Little Bear who moved back and forth between Montana and Manitoba in the late 19th century is yet another example of the many Indigenous peoples who were quote, exiled, deported, or who sought refuge in either the United States or Canada. 
What is critical to consider and something that Carleton PhD student Tyler Betke has been drawing attention to in her wonderful work is that the language of refuge, exile and deportation all or normalizes the nation state system and the associated territorial claims. Meanwhile, indigenous peoples involved all had different understandings of land, authority and sovereignty. And so describing the indigenous peoples who moved across emerging borders as refugees erases their traditional claims to land and undermines indigenous belief systems, epistemologies and interpretations of events, key facets of the settler colonial project. And so here the idea of refugee denial takes on a different register because it is not so much about denying claims to refugee, refugeehood from the global south or the possibility that the global north may also produce refugees. It is about resisting and reclaiming a different understanding of kinship, land, territory and sovereignty, which is critical anti-colonial and anti-imperial work. By way of conclusion, let me say briefly that when states position themselves as normative sites of refuge, even as they regularly deny entry or deny the possibility of violence and displacement within, they are making claims to legitimacy. This is not a new idea and is, well established, and is a well-established framework in refugee studies. I continue to lean on Emma Haddad's work in this regard. But as we think about the enduring connections and tensions between the, the global north and the global south as frameworks for analysis and for discuss, discussing refugee issues, we need to be very careful about how we normalize the global north as a site of refuge. If we look to the historical as well as the recent past, then we see ample evidence of countries that claim a humanitarian mantle behaving badly. Equally important, we also see non-state actors and especially racialized citizens wrestling with the ideas of citizenship and refugeehood, which I think raises important questions about solidarity and affinity. Several years ago now, I attended a workshop in which Indigenous elders from British Columbia organized a sharing circle with refugee youth. And in this session, the elders talked about losing their traditional homelands, losing their language and the violence of Canada's residential school system. The youth in, atten in attendance didn't say we've had the same experience, but the stories they recounted resonate, resonated as evidence of their, um, their engagement with what they were hearing. For instance, there was a Kurdish refugee who spoke about the loss of his language and his family home. And related, relatedly, there are numerous contemporary examples of First Nations and Native Americans offering refuge and sanctuary to refugees or people facing deportation. And so when Indigenous peoples contest the language, hood, language of refugeehood in thinking about the historical past, they are also doing so with a keen sense of what contemporary refugees have endured. The politics of refugee denial are therefore complex, multifaceted, and woven into the fabric of many societies. And I hope that these brief comments have offered some food for thought as the center launches its webinar series on refugees and forced displacement in the global south and i look forward to your questions and comments thank you so much laura for that really thought-provoking and insightful tour de force 